The message you're about to hear is part of a series on the supernatural life of the prophet Elisha from the Old Testament. The name of the series is called God Touched, and it is in my heart through this series to be able to communicate and expound upon the life of Elisha in a way that shows you the supernatural, miraculous, God-touched way that his life was used in his generation. Why would I spend time teaching and preaching a message in a series like this? Well, because I believe that we need the same touch on our lives today. We live in a similar time in which Elisha lived. We are facing similar obstacles that that prophet's faced. And you and I have been called of God to be lights in a dark generation, and we can't do that in our own power. So I'm praying that as you listen to this message and hopefully the whole series, that God will stir your heart to call upon him and expect the same supernatural touch on Elisha's life to find your life. The Holy Spirit lives within us. The Son of God reigns above us. The Father one day is sending for us. And friends, when that moment comes, I don't want to be living in my own power. I want to be living a life that is God-touched. Hope you enjoy the message. 2 Kings chapter 13. The Bible says that when Elisha had fallen sick with the illness of which he was to die, Joash, king of Israel, went down to him and wept before him, crying, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. And Elisha said to him, Take a bow and arrows. So he took a bow and arrows. Then he said to the king of Israel, Draw the bow. And he drew it. And Elisha laid his hands on the king's hands, and he said, Open the window eastward, and he opened it. Then Elisha said, Shoot, and he shot. And he said, The Lord's arrow of victory, the arrow of victory over Syria, you shall fight the Syrians in Aphek until you have made an end of them. And he said, Take the arrows, and he took them. And he said to the king of Israel, Strike the ground with them. And he struck three times and stopped. Then the man of God was angry with him and said, You should have struck five or six times. Then you would have struck down Syria until you had made an end of it. But now you will strike down Syria only three times. So Elisha died and they buried him. Now bands of bad guys, Moabites, used to invade the land in the spring of the year. And as a man was being buried, behold, a marauding band was seen, and the man was thrown into the grave of Elisha. And as soon as the man touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood on his feet. I have the privilege of sharing you an easy message today. So many of you in this room, so many watching, so many that will listen later, you're making a difference in the kingdom. Maybe your name's not plastered across a big sign somewhere. Maybe you feel at moments that what you do for the Lord is undervalued by you, maybe underesteemed by others. Maybe you feel like nobody notices. There's a beautiful verse in the book of Hebrews that that takes away that that anxiety that maybe what we're doing isn't enough. Uh, Hebrews 6.10 says, The Lord is not unrighteous to forget your work. And your labor of love that you've showed toward his name and that you minister to the saints and you continue to minister. So in other words, God looks down from time to time and he says, I know they haven't noticed. I know you may not feel it's making a difference, but I'm Papa and I see what you're doing and your life is making a difference. You, my child, just keep going after it. And so we do. But here's something that I really, the older I get, the more I just kind of salivate after I don't want my influence to die when I do. I don't want my anointing to disappear and its effectiveness when they put me in a casket and lower me six feet feet under. I don't want my life to stop mattering when I stop living. And so the older I get, I recognize that I need to do two things. I need to minister in the now. I need to learn from the past, minister in the now, but I need to sow into the future. I've got to be thinking about how what I'm choosing to do now, what I'm saying yes to, what I'm saying no to, how is that setting the table that my grandkids will one day eat at? 
And so this comes down to this, this crucible in Elisha's life, this last moment, this last prophetic act. And so let's go through this, and I'm going to encourage you today, but I'm going to, I'm going to warn you ahead of time, if you brought a pair of steel boots, put them on quick. Because I am going to challenge you in, in your walk with the Lord, in your faith, in your journey with Jesus, because as Micah 4.9 uh, illustrates, when, when the prophet said this, he said, why are you crying, is there not a king in you? And my call today is to say to the king that's in you, King Jesus, Lord, turn him loose. And for you to say, let the king in me start living out of me in a greater level. So let's look into the word today. And let's begin with Elisha's last moments. This is where we see Elisha, weak in his body, but strong in spirit. Watch what he's doing as a very old man in his very last days. First of all, Elisha continued to influence Verse 14 says that he had fallen sick with the illness that would ultimately he would die from. And Jehoash, one of the kings of the northern tribe, king of Israel, went down to him and wept before him, crying, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and the horsemen thereof. This king is not a godly king. This king is kind of an ungodly guy. In Israel, because of their unrepentant spirits toward the Lord, they're being disciplined and chastised by the Lord. Earlier in the chapter, it says that their, their army had been so riddled, they had been so defeated militarily. They had no power nationally and strength militarily, and they had been whittled down to about uh, uh, 50 chariots and just a, a handful, comparatively, of soldiers to fight in the army, and they were getting defeated and defeated and defeated. And part of it was because of this ungodly king and the ones that went before him leading people away from the, the, the loving obedience unto God. And so they find themselves in a time of decline, and yet, even in the midst of his ungodliness, when the king hears that Elisha is sick and nearly dead... His heart is moved because though he is unrepentant himself, he's, he's known enough about Elisha to know that Elisha is a true man of God, that Elisha has a, uh, um, an audience with the Almighty. It, it's kind of like some of us. I, I didn't get saved till I was 24, and I did church, and I did all the, the religious stuff. I, I was in the Bible Belt, so it got all over me, and, and so I would do what it took, but I was living a, a, a really reckless and disobedient and renegade lifestyle. But when trouble hit, there was always a couple of real Christians that I knew where to find, and I'd go after them. I wasn't about to repent, but I felt like if I can get close to them, maybe some of that goodness on them will get on me. Doesn't work that way, but that's the superstitious way I lived back in those days. And so the king goes, and he sees Elisha dying, and he looks at Elisha as the only physical visible um, indicator that God is still with Israel. And that's about to be lost. He's about to die, and he, he cries out, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen thereof. That was the same thing Elisha cried when Elijah got taken up to heaven. Just a quick snapshot on Elijah's life. Elijah, excuse me, Elisha's life. Elisha had received the double portion of anointing from Elijah. And he had so lived out in the ensuing decades a life of miraculous power, a life of faithful servanthood, a life of love and compassion and care for the least among him in his generation. And by the time Elisha gets to his life, Elisha never sought to make a name for himself, but at the end of Elisha's life, the same thing he once cried out as a young man about Elijah is now spoken over him. It's awesome that God will give you a testimony. You just have to steward it. The Lord will write your epitaph. And when the time comes to die, let it be say, as was said of the Apostle Paul, they glorified God because of me. So we go further down into this. So Elisha continues to influence, and he continues to invest. So look in verse number 15 and 16. Elisha says to the king, take that bow and that arrow from your military guard there and bring it over here. So he took a bow and arrows. Then he said to the king of Israel, draw the bow, and he drew it. And Elisha laid his hands on the king's hands. This is, this is an awesome prophetic act. So Elisha, feeble and weak and old, musters enough strength when the king comes into the room. And Elisha doesn't use his, his last moment to wag a finger in the face of the king for his past immorality and heathenism, but, but he literally makes physical contact. 
He's about to do a prophetic act that's going to speak over the immediate destiny of Israel. But I like the fact that it wasn't just an oracle, it wasn't just verbal. But Elisha took time to make human contact. And as the king drew the bow back, Elisha somehow got behind him and put his hands. And it was a symbolic indicator that, that Elisha, representing God and God's ways, was still willing to bless this king in Israel who'd moved so far away from the Lord. You know, oftentimes there are going to be people in your life and mine, and they know we're Christians. It could be people in our family over the Christmas holidays. You're going to probably intersect with some family members that maybe don't take Christ as seriously as you. Maybe they live in certain ways that you might disapprove of. And do you know what they expect from us? They expect our sermons. They expect our judgmental critiques. They expect all of our thou shalt nots ad nauseum. That they expect us to belch up yet another wonderful soliloquy about why they aren't right with God. But you know what they don't expect? They don't expect that in the moment of their weakness and need that you would make contact with them intentionally in order to strengthen them and help them. And that's what Elisha does. So here he is in the end of his days, and he doesn't even have a great candidate to invest in, but it's the only candidate that he has to invest in. And so he continues to invest, and he, he makes contact with this king. Go down to verse 17. This is what I really love about this old man. Elisha continued with vision. So he's got his hands on him, and he says, I want you to look out this window. And it was open to eastward. That's where the enemies were coming from. And Elisha says, shoot the arrow. And he shot it. And Elisha says as the arrow is flying, the Lord's arrow of victory, the Lord's arrow of victory over Syria, for you will fight the Syrians in Aphek until you have made an end of them. So what the Lord was doing through Elisha was Elisha was, here he is at the end of his life and he's still flowing in the prophetic. He's still receiving, discerning, speaking, and, and strengthening. And the word was this, That as that arrow was traveling over territory that had been hotly contested by the Arameans, here called the Syrians, Elisha was saying this, if you will walk with the Lord, then you will experience victory over this enemy who has been whipping you season after season after season after season. So it was a familiar enemy, it was familiar territory, but the dynamic was that the king was showing a little humility, and Elisha says, God will take that open moment of humility, and an enemy that has been defeating you constantly for season after season will now be defeated by you if you will continue to trust. It's a good word, by the way. Um, Because I know none of you have any sticking spots in your walk with the Lord where the enemy seems to win. I know, that's just me and Dustin. We we, we wrestle, and I know y'all are... Yeah, I know you're not, actually, so just, let's, let's just be real. Um, and sometimes we think on that last defeat that that was the last defeat that God's done with us. That God's not going to offer us any more chances of overcoming, any more chances of victory, any more chances of breakthrough or deliverance. But that's not the God of the Bible, because the God of the Bible is drawn to brokenness. And if we will humble ourselves in the, under the mighty hand of God, then he will exalt us in due time. And so the king has this. And we're going to unpack it a little bit further. So go down further with me in verses 18 to 19. And we're going to see Elisha was not just simply weak in body while being strong in spirit, but he was bold in vision and he was elevated in his expectation. Let let me just preface this for a moment. When I read of his life, and we don't know exactly how old he is, but he's not a young buck anymore. Elisha is an older man. He could, some, some scholars say that he was over 100 years old. We, frankly, we don't know, but it is highly likely that he was in his 80s, approaching 90s, maybe even older. And he hadn't lost his vision. He had not lost his confidence in God. And, and by the way, he's living in a society that is anti-God. They're apostate. They had moved away from God. They had welcomed other gods into their life and put the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, their God, the only God, they had put him on the back burner and they were serving Canaanite gods, which were really spicy gods to serve. And yet, Elisha doesn't get sour, doesn't get critical, doesn't isolate himself in some religious ivory tower from whence he can look down upon the heathen masses and say, you're a sinner, you're a sinner, you're a sinner, you're a sinner. That's religion, by the way. And God doesn't advocate that kind of approach to people. 
And so what does he do? Well, let's look at it because he's about to impart vision and you're going to see a side of Elisha in this last chapter of his life that we have not seen yet in his entire story up to this point. First of all, we see an opportunity in verse number 18. So the arrow's been shot through the window, but there's still a quiver full of more arrows. And Elisha says to the king, take the arrows. And the king obeys. He took them. And he said to the king of Israel, strike the ground with them. Now, right now, this doesn't make any sense. It would not have made sense to the king. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to you and I. But let me tell you what's happening here. This is what we call a prophetic act. This is an action that has prophetic, yet to be seen significant, attached to it. And Elisha, as the prophet, and he in that day would have been the spokesman for God, but Elisha, as the prophet, is sensing what the Lord is doing. And the way the prophetic works, and I'm not going to break it down into a formula that we chase, but I've experienced enough of it to know. Elisha's hearing God in the moment and saying what God is saying. That's what Jesus did. Jesus said, I only speak what I hear the Father saying. I only do what I see the Father doing. And so in this moment, Elisha is doing the same thing. He's hearing the Father speak, and he's speaking it. And what's about to happen is going to unfold as a significant prophetic act. Now, we're Southern evangelicals, and we've been trained. I was trained both just in my previous years and also in school and seminary. was trained, Bible, 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 Bible. And I'm still a massive Bible guy. We're in the Bible. We're going verse by verse through the Bible. But I want you to understand also that God hasn't lost his creativity in the last 2,000 years. That sometimes visual images, sensory images, prophetic acts, things that in the natural look kind of strange or awkward or unfamiliar. But God often wants to raise our awareness, not just through didactic teaching of the scripture verse by verse, but sometimes he wants to appeal to that, that inner artist inside of us, to where the words take on imagery. And that's what he does right here. And so what is the king going to do? Because the king's been told, take some arrows and either shoot them into the ground. The Hebrew word struck them is, is not necessarily clear. He's either shooting them into the ground or he's literally striking the ground with the arrows. So look at what happens. We see an opportunity, but then we see a hesitancy. The Bible says that the king struck three times and stopped. Now, go ahead and suppress your your outcry that this what's about to happen seems unfair just go ahead and let your bible take authority over your thoughts and understand that though you and i can't comprehend the the intricate dynamics of what the problem is here elisha knew it and so i am going to surmise it might have looked something like this so elisha is taking the king out of his comfort zone with this prophetic act it's one thing to shoot an arrow i mean that's symbolic they had their moment that's great that's awesome he's just been told that he's going to bring down the enemy because god's with him but elisha is going to do something to draw out the king's passion or at least to expose the lack of it so part b is now the arrow has flown get the remaining arrows and strike the ground that's where the battle was taking place it was over territory strike the ground and so the picture seems to be of one of awkwardness that the king takes three arrows, and let's just say he, he strikes the ground physically, he just boom, 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 three times, he's done, he puts them back. There was some noted hesitancy in him. A verse that shaped my life when I was born again in 1994 out of a life of misery, drugs, alcohol bondage absolute borderline insanity and addiction so characterized my life that when i got saved the only thing i knew i could do and be safe was to devour the word of god so i literally sat in my apartment where i was still living with my roommate from just weeks before where i had been enjoying all sorts of unlawful things and the the alcohol and the drugs were still filling the apartment so i had this tiny little room and i would run into the house run through the front door shade my eyes from the what was going on in the den and close and lock my door and i'd read my bible and for some strange reason the lord led me to the book of colossians 
I didn't have anybody really, really guiding me at that time, but I devoured the book of Colossians. When I came to Colossians chapter 3, I started coming alive because the first time in my life, somebody was telling me how to live for God, and I had the power to do it. And when I came to Colossians chapter 3, verse 23, this became a foundational verse in my life. Whatever you do, do it heartily, as not unto man, but as unto the Lord. Whatever you do in life, do it with your whole heart because you're not doing it for humans, you're doing it for God. And so this king didn't have Colossians 3.23. So he went about the prophetic act half-heartedly and he revealed his hesitancy about the things of God. Go down into verse number 19. Y'all still with me? We see the reality. Then the man of God, Elisha, was angry with him and said, you should have struck five or six times. Then you would have struck down Syria until you made an end of it, but now you will strike down Syria only three times. Now the natural man says, hey, time out. That's not fair. He didn't give them specific instructions, but he held them accountable for not obeying specific instructions. Well, you're not God, I'm not God. Elisha was in the moment. He was speaking for God, and let's just leave it where it is. The king approached it with less confidence, less faith, less wholeheartedness than what the situation demanded. Elisha looks at him and he says, King, you see all those arrows in the quiver? Why did you only take three of them? I see five or six in that quiver. Why didn't you take them all and do it with your own whole heart? We're dealing with national Israel. You're the leader. You're the one leading the people. I'm I'm, I'm extrapolating here. You're the one leading the people. They're dependent on you. You're coming up against the serious enemy, and you're approaching this thing half-heartedly. And you're not taking the fullness of what God is offering you. King, you should have struck six times, but you only did it three times. You approached it half-heartedly. Therefore, you're only going to get half the victory you could have gotten. That's a hard word, man. The Bible tells us that the things that were written aforetime were written for our instruction and our learning. So when I read the Old Testament, I read it with these goggles on. It says, that's for me. That's for my instruction. That's for my learning. So what do I want to learn? Well, here here again, we find that, that principle of he struck three times, so he's going to get three times striking worth of victory. Did you know that in... Matthew 8, 13, Matthew 9, 22, Matthew 9, 29, Matthew 15, 28, Mark 10, 52, and more, that the Son of God makes statements to different people that basically are all summarized this way. Be it unto you according to your faith. I will meet you at the proportional level of what you want to give me to use. I will meet you at the level of your trust, but he never promises to always go above and beyond it. Now, there is the statement from Paul to the church at Ephesus that says he's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. But my friends, that is never given to us. So we'll just say, well, I don't have to ask God for anything. He's going to do better than anything. Ah, No, 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 no. You are called to participate. You are called to, to press in. You're called to come to the altar. To come and to the one whose arms are open wide. And he will meet you at the level of your faith. He does it for individuals and he does it for churches. There's a lot of stagnant churches peppering the landscape of the United States of America. And here's something amazing. Not a single one of them has to be stagnant. There's a lot of lukewarm Christians out there been living lukewarm for a long time and it's an astounding thought there's not a single one of them out there that has to live that way there's a lot of people that used to walk in the fullness of the spirit that are now walking full of something else and they don't have to live that way but they're waiting on God to do something and God is simply saying I love you so much but why are you waiting on me I'm waiting on you be it unto you according to your faith your faith has made you whole Your faith has saved you. There there is a blight in the modern church, and it comes from a misappropriation of the doctrine of God's sovereignty. We know God's in control. We know that. If you don't like that, then you tell me who is in control. 
It is God. God is in control. But what happens is people assign to God accountability for stuff that God has given us to be accountable over. And so when life gets sideways because of our disobedience, we say, well, it's just the Lord. And the Lord says, no, that wasn't me. That was you. You see, brothers and sisters, Elisha got angry. We've been studying his life for weeks. You know how many times he's been angry up to this point? Zero. What made the prophet mad? That one to whom much was given, this king, had so little expectation of God that he was just going through the motions at a critical season where he needed to be living wholeheartedly for the Lord. Does Elisha feel like he stepped over a line, crossed a line? I remember reading that years ago. I was like, simmer down, Elisha. It's all good, man. It's okay. You know? But Elisha realized that his, his nation, his country, his, his people weren't going to be able to experience the victory because the leader didn't have the faith to experience the victory. So the Bible said he got really mad. Let me, let me just say something to you. Let me speak to us as a, a faith family, a church. I, th- I think the most insulting thing your leaders at Newbridge could do to you is to expect nothing of you. I think that is such an extreme insult to the people of God when leaders in churches don't challenge the people, but they try to keep them comfortable and happy and safe. By the way, you know why a lot of them do that? Because comfortable, safe, happy Christians will write big checks. But it's the most insulting thing to say, guys, the Lord has deposited us here for such a time as this so that we may master the art of playing it safe. If that is your heart cry, then I'm going to present to you two options here at Newbridge. One, humble yourself and ask God to help you because you're in the wrong church. You're in the wrong, but we want you to stay, but I'm just going to tell you, if it's safe, comfortable, happy that you're looking for, you got the address wrong. The other option is that you would just, and don't do this in your life, especially in this season, that you would just go find a leadership team at a different place that will do all the things that I just described. Pat you on the head, tell you how great everything is, tell you it's your best day now, and love you, and just get you to the point where just everything's ooey and gooey, and, and you just do ooey gooey kingdom for the rest of your days. And meanwhile, the enemy's taking territory. So at Newbridge, I just speak for a moment on behalf of our pastoral staff and our elders. I just say, if your leaders don't challenge you, it's because they don't believe in you. Leaders should impart an expectation of excellence from those they've been given to shepherd. And that's why you're never comfortable too long around here. It's because we believe in you. It's because we believe that God has assembled a congregation of people to whom he continues to add similar people who are saying that they're tired of the status quo. They're tired of denominational norms and tally marks. And yeah, we've read. They're tired of all the incessant religiosity that clouds the gospel. They're tired of just the, the, the rote, memorized programs. And everything's the same. And the mission never has any creativity. And there's never an uptick. And there's never a bow down. It's just always flatlined. And so... 
Elisha sees this in a microcosm in this king. You and I are seeing this in our generation. But the beauty of what God is doing at New Bridge Church and in other assemblies in this region is that there is such a hunger in people that are saying, please don't feed us religion. We're on a fast, a permanent fast from religion. But we want to feast on the gospel. We want to feast on the kingdom. We want the power and the authority of the word. And we want the manifest presence of the Holy Spirit. That is what is happening. I've been saving, saying for years it's going to happen. I'm telling you, it is happening. And so what we're wanting to do is we're wanting to step deeper into it, deeper and deeper and deeper. We don't want to be ankle deep in a river that God has given us. We don't want to be knee deep in a river that God has given us or waist deep or even neck deep. We want to be in beautifully in over our heads. Amen. So last, last point, and then I'm going to call the worship team up in a few moments. Don't get froggy. Sit there for a few more moments. And then Pastor Dustin will join me on the stage. So Elisha deals with the king, and let's, let's say goodbye to him. Positioned in heaven, still imparting on earth. This is crazy. This is so good, but it is crazy. It's not a fairy tale, and it's not a myth. This straight up happened. The Holy Spirit ensured that this would be preserved for our instruction and our learning. And so I want to just show you what it looks like to have an anointing that outlives you. Let's just be real. One day, our last day on earth is going to find us. It's an unpleasant thought, but for the redeemed, it ought to be an admixture. You know, I, I love my wife, I love my children, I love you dear folks. I, I, love, I love the life the Lord has given me. Uh, for the first half of my life I couldn't say that, but I can say that now. But if, if, if Jesus wants me to go home today, I'm like really ready. <laughs> Not because I'm sad, but because it's good here, but it's better there. But it's going to happen. The Bible says Elisha died and they buried him. I mean, that's it. That's some people die in scripture and you got like a chapter and a half that describes how the country lamented and mourned and fasted and wept and you know it, it was a big deal and for whatever reason when Elisha died it just said they buried him it could be because he wasn't as honored in that season of Israel's history because Israel was was not honoring God and Elisha was the spokesman for God it could have been a lot of reasons, but basically they, they carved out a, a tomb in, in a hillside somewhere. That's the way they buried them. And they put Elisha's body in it, and uh, they, they covered the tomb. Uh, death is, is not overly dignified. There, there are seasons. Young people hear me on this one. I can actually say that now because I'm not the young person anymore, but I... I I'm in between. When you're young, you almost never think of death because you're powerful. You look good. You feel good. You think you know everything. <laughs> I didn't say that. Your parents did. So You got all the answers. You got answers to questions nobody's even asked. And, and there's a certain potency that goes along with being young. And there is this, this um, hinge, and eventually that door swings, and you start recognizing, okay, I was, when I was younger, I was foolish. I was a little bit, a lot of bluster, a whole lot of zeal, not a whole lot of wisdom. And that's great. It happens to all of us. I mean, it's just the process in life. But, but eventually, all the strength that you feel when you're young, you never think about death, it, it changes, and then you hit a certain age, and you start becoming aware that you're not quite physically, maybe even mentally, what you used to be. And I haven't, I haven't crossed this next section yet, but there's even another section where you realize, I've only got a handful of years left. And then there comes a time where some people will gather around one day, and somebody will say some nice things about you, but your body will be in a, a casket or an urn, and your time's done. Now, I don't say that to be cryptic for any of us. I don't want to depress us, but, you know, 
the reality that we're going to die, and the Bible says it's appointed unto you to die once, but that's not the end of the story. What comes next? The judgment. We stand before the Lord and we give an account for what we did in our lives. And so I really want us to really think about the days we have left. Spend those days giving, not getting. Spend those days blessing, not cursing. Spend spend those days believing, not wavering. Spend those days marching on the front lines, not sitting on the sidelines. Spend those days walking with God, not merely talking about God. Because one day, it'll be written, so Jeff died and they buried him. And at that point, my physical ability on earth to do anything is over. But there is a possibility that you and I can have an anointing that outlives us. That when we physically stop, our influence says, that's fine, I didn't need your body anyway. I'm going to continue. And I want that. And it sounds like nine of you want it too. (laughs) Either clap or don't, amen. (laughs) Amen. So look what happens. So in in the second half of verse 20, I'm almost done. Our last day on earth finds us, but our activity on earth continues without us. This is possible. This This is good. This is what we want. Now, bands of Moabites used to invade the land in the spring of the year. Okay, so it's a new season. Elisha's been dead a while, and now there's a new enemy on the front. And Bible the Bible says, and as a man was being buried, so some guy dies and they're getting ready to do his funeral, behold, a marauding band, these Moabites start attacking this area. And as they were being seen, the, those that the, were doing the funeral throw the man in the closest grave that happened to be the grave of Elisha. And so, I mean, I got a little bit of a sense of humor. I don't have time to really milk it right now. But you know, they're marching and they're solemn and there's a you know, the caskets on the shoulders and they're marching and they're Solomon, uh, solemn and they're weeping and wailing and s- somebody over there says, Moabites! And they drop and they, they think, what do we do? What do we do? And they think, well, we got to finish the funeral. There's a tomb. Uh, Johan, move that stone. Okay, and they move the stone. And somebody tosses the body in and they say, God bless them, amen. Pew! They get out of there. They're gone. They dump them in the nearest grave, but the providence of God just so happened to let that grave be Elisha's grave. So look down in verse 21 in the end of it. Our impact, friends, on earth can continue beyond us. The Bible says as soon as the man, the dead man, touched the bones, the bones of Elisha, he revived And he stood on his feet. Come on. (laughs) I wonder if he got a refund from the funeral director. I'd be like, hey. (laughs) Listen, Elisha was dead and in heaven. But Elisha's ministry in life was still propagating kingdom difference. While he was alive, He operated and functioned in the will of God, to the glory of God, in the power of God, by the Spirit of God. And he just did that for several decades, and it was never about Elisha. And so he's up in heaven, and he's with the Lord. Be absent with the body, be present with the Lord. And so he is, in in some way, he is in paradise. And and when that body touches Elisha, I mean, it was bones. He'd, it was decay had already taken place. Just dry bones. Dry bones that still somehow pulsed with the life of God. So that when death touched life, death had to flee. And the man stood up. Yeah. That's, that's one of the illustrations in Scripture that just lets me know when I give up on somebody, I'm a fool. Because if a dead man can touch bones and live, 
then who am I to give up on somebody that looks like they're too far gone? Thank God there was a guy that didn't give up on me back in the early 90s when I was as good as dead. Some of you are here because there was one or two people that never gave up on you. And there's one or two people in your life that need you to never give up on them. What you're doing today in this season and what you've done in the past has made and is making a difference. You don't see it all yet. I mean, in my opinion, that's Elisha's greatest miracle. and He wasn't even on earth when it happened. What do we do? We faithfully live cultivating deep friendship with God. We commit ourselves in trusting obedience to him, even when we can't see what's going to happen. And we just live that way today. And we wake up tomorrow and we do it again. And those days consecutively stacked, we're never perfect in them, by the way. But those days become months and years, and those years become a lifetime. And then when the Bible says, then, put your name there, died, and they buried him or her. There's the realistic, the reality, that though you're in heaven receiving the riches of your full inheritance, the things you did down here still pulse. There's still life. And when people come into contact with that, they're going to live. 